big question is this. How do we take a seemingly ordinary world and make it beyond extraordinary? In yoga, there is so much more than meets the eye. And it's not just the things we do on our yoga mats that make the biggest difference. That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answer. My name is Austin Bitsis, and welcome to Life as a Secret Yogi. We are love and awareness. Think about a time when you felt loved. Take a moment to cultivate that feeling inside of you. Now come back to that feeling the rest of your day and into tomorrow. As you know, I'm a big fan of mantras, so to trigger that feeling and bring your mind back to this feeling of love, repeat. I am love and awareness whenever you need. Having this feeling of being loved helps us spread love. Our thoughts and therefore our actions are contagious, so let's make them good ones. It is easier to send love when we feel love. And look, I'm not trying to be some wishy-washy spiritual guru. What I'm trying to do is make a positive impact in all those I come in contact with. I was drawn to yoga and still am by the physical benefits of yoga, just as our guest today, Nicole Calhoun. But that opened the door to discovering the real yoga, which is rooted in thousands of years of tradition and has been practiced by wise men and women over those thousands of years because the practice is universal at its core. As humans... Our minds have changed little over these thousands of years, and our thoughts and our world at the surface level may seem different, but at the core have really changed little. So we still feel love, anger, guilt, fear, and so on, just as we did thousands and thousands of years ago. The formal definition of yoga varies from text to text, but my definition is the practice of controlling our mind to therefore control our body, and that is yoga. Therefore, we can control our thoughts and our actions and create a harmonious community, a beautiful community of people that we call secret yogis. We all have this secret yogi inside of us. It's like our inner superpower we are all born with. So, today I have the pleasure of speaking with Nicole Calhoun, on Life as a Secret Yogi, and something unique about Nicole is she really brought the community back to Western yoga. We spoke about the importance of community, which can easily be forgotten in the yoga studio. Just think, the lights are dimmed, everyone is listening to the teacher, but no one is speaking to each other, or even, for the most part, we probably find ourselves not wanting to make even an ounce of noise before or after the class in fear of disturbing the peace. As someone who came from a long distance running background, I absolutely loved to go on long runs with my friends because we really connected with each other and with nature. And I made a deep, long lasting, well, I made deep, long lasting relationships with my friends that formed the community of people that had similar interests. We speak about how Nicole took her entrepreneurial mind to work and dealt with the issues when she created her studio, Elixir Yoga Lounge. Also, we recorded this during the COVID-19 quarantine time, so we discussed the future of the yoga industry in uncertain times. And hey, as Crystal Bashirs, a previous guest of ours, says, let's stop saying social distancing and start saying physical distancing, because that's what it really is. And let's build stronger social ties, utilizing all the modern-day resources we have all around us. But before we jump in, a quick word from our sponsor. (laughs) Okay, we actually still don't have a sponsor. So as of today, uh, we we still don't have a sponsor, and that's okay because you know why? I'm willing to invest both time and money into this show because I really deeply believe in creating a community that is helping each other bring beauty into our lives. The Secret Yogi Society is to utilize the universality of yoga to bring back those feelings when we were a little kid that this world was and is a magical place and anything is possible. So today, I wish we were sponsored by Joe Dispenza's book called Becoming Supernatural. Yes, another book. Don't judge me. I'm a simple guy, so I don't use a lot of products. And the only things I really splurge on is education in the form of books. And I love books. So 
I remember when this book first came out a few years ago, it was just the one thing I was looking for at the time. It mixed insightful scientific studies with ancient wisdom to show how people like you and me can experience a more mystical life. It basically proved the power of meditation and the brain through scientific studies. The case studies in the book will blow your mind. So if you're someone who wants to make life beautiful through yoga and meditation and therefore the the power of the mind, uh, but you're also someone like me who needs to see the data first, then this book is definitely for you. So it's called Becoming Supernatural, How Common People Are Doing the Uncommon, and it's by Joe Dispenza, who I'll most definitely reach out to as a future guest on this episode if you're interested in hearing about his life as a secret yogi. Let me know in the comments below if he's someone you'd like to have on the show. As always, you don't have to, but of course, if you used an affiliate link for Becoming Supernatural in the show notes below, it would be greatly appreciated as all the proceeds go directly back into supporting the show. Thank you so much for all who support this show, and I will make sure to pay it back tenfold. So without further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy Nicole's episode, and make sure to check out Nicole's powerful guided meditation that you won't want to miss in the episode following this. Nicole Calhoun has been a passionate athlete all her life. Nicole is not only a successful athlete, as you can tell from her Instagram, but she has also channeled her energy into her academics. What really makes Nicole a secret yogi is how she managed to achieve her doctorates in molecular biology, all while creating Elixir Yoga Lounge. If you haven't taken a class or seen Elixir Yoga Lounge online, it is pretty awesome. It is notorious for its sweaty flows, hip hop music, and its supportive community. Besides teaching yoga, her entrepreneurial endeavors and being a scientist, she is also a Lululemon Summit ambassador and has a strong social media presence in which she shares her passion for yoga, traveling, and living through positivity. So thank you, Devin Davis, for introducing me to Nicole, and I am more than grateful to having the time to speak with you, Nicole, on the show. So let's dive right in. Uh, you. You do a lot, it seems, and really excel on all levels. I'm sure that wasn't even an exhaustive list that I just mentioned, <laughs> but how did you get started in yoga? Like, can you take us back to when you first got started and, and, and really paint a vivid picture where you were in life? Yeah. So I actually got started in yoga because um, in my twenties, I'd had a series of car accidents. <laughs> I'd been rear ended, you know, like at least three times in my twenties and really developed this chronic you know, back issue and this chronic back and neck pain for, as a result of those issues. Um, I never got to the point where I was taking pain medication, thank goodness, but um, I would see chiropractors and, you know, I would leave feeling okay. And then, but it was always a temporary fix. It was like a band aid. Um, and I wanted a permanent fix, you know, obviously I didn't want to live my entire life with this back pain. And so somebody mentioned to me, hey, why don't you try yoga? And I think a lot of people get into yoga because somebody says, hey, why don't you try yoga, you know, to fix your ailment, not knowing that it's such a onion of layers that you have to unwrap to get into the heart of the practice, not knowing anything about that, just knowing the physical aspects of what it could do. Um, so I took my um, first power yoga class at a studio in Dallas and got my butt kicked. <laughs> But after that, I was, I was kind of addicted to it. And it became, after a while, medicinal. I noticed that when I didn't practice for like a week or a few days that, you know, I would have some reoccurring pain that would come back. And so in the beginning, it was, it was you know, truly medicinal. I had to go to feel better. Mm -hmm. And I think we have very similar stories. I was a mm -hmm. competitive distance runner. And after my collegiate career, I was dealing with some severe hip flexor pain. And that mm -hmm. was the one thing that helped. And I went to so many exercise scientists. I went to um, chiropractors, doctors. And it, like you said, it was only a temporary fix. And it wasn't until I started doing yoga consistently that I was able to overcome those injuries. So that's, that's yes. funny that we have very similar stories. <laughs> uh, so what was your first reaction? Like when somebody said like, oh, take a, a power yoga class. Did you stay well, for the Shavasana? <laughs> Did you? 
<laughs> yeah, well, so the funny thing is, is that, you know, I, at this time, I didn't know anything about the different types of yoga, you know, it was just, it was just all yoga to me. And so um, I didn't even really know that the class I was going to was a power yoga class. I just thought it was, you know, a regular kind of flow class. And um, yeah, I stayed for Shavasana <laughs> there. I kind of passed out. Um, there were several times that, you know, I thought I was going to pass out and be embarrassed. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to pass out. I'm going to be embarrassed. And <laughs> I hope I don't pass out kind of thing. Um, but in the midst of not trying not to pass out, I was really fascinated by everything. Just fascinated by, you know, the breath that was flowing around me, the, the poses, the vernacular that the teacher was using and just inspired by other yogis around me that had been practicing for a while. I, I was really attracted to the, to the physicality of the practice. I was um, a college uh, runner, also as a hurdler at Texas Tech University. And, you know, as someone who's used to strenuous exercises, exercising like that, I was attracted to, to the hardness of the class. And so it, I don't know if power yoga was my best bet to solve my back problems, <laughs> but eventually, you know, it did after sticking with the practice, but the, uh, just the physicality, I was hooked from day one. And yes, I stayed for Shavasana and got a good rest. <laughs> that's yeah, no, that that's, that's great. And so does that lead you straight into teaching? Like how long was it before that you said like, oh, this no, is no. the one thing? So I probably started, I started practicing and I think in 09. And then I never even thought about teaching for at least five years. <laughs> So I was actually one of the most, um, probably the most mature practitioners with regards to, you know, having practiced so long within my teacher training. So, you know, a lot of the people who only, only, had only been practicing like a year or maybe, you know, a year and a half, or there were some people who had only been practicing for some months and decided that they wanted to be a teacher. But for me, it was six years. And I, I'm really, really grateful that I took those six years to really dive deep into my personal practice and develop my personal practice before I took it to the next step to learning everything that it means to be a yogi and to practice yoga. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like it gave me kind of an upper hand within the training because a lot of people, while a lot of people were struggling and focusing on the physical part, like I was, I was past that. And so I was able to focus more heavily on the other aspects of what it means to be a yogi. Yeah. And has that kind of led you on? Do you think yoga really has helped you find your purpose? Or do you think you've been going that direction and yoga was just one tool along your journey or one step along your journey? Oh, it definitely helped me find my purpose. <laughs> mm -hmm. It definitely, definitely helped me find my purpose. Um, because I never, I didn't, never really had a purpose until I found something that gave me purpose. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and when I found this tool that could, could essentially transform you on so many levels, then it became clear what my purpose was to learn how to teach this safely and effectively and to show people how they can use this tool to transform their lives mm -hmm. into something greater. Yeah. And it's a great tool in the aspect that it's, both physical and mental and somebody coming from an athletic background like myself, mm -hmm. like I found it because of the, the physical benefits of healing myself physically, mm -hmm. but then it opened up the whole door down the line right. of the, the mental benefits and wanting to know more. Mm -hmm. So what would you say your, your Dharma or purpose is now? Like if somebody asked you today, what, what is your Dharma? What is your purpose? So very, very, broadly <laughs> would be yoga, to say yoga for all. I truly, I feel like, you know, as a woman of color in yoga, you know, the longer you're in this yoga business, the more you start to see things through a real lens instead of a rose colored lens. And, you know, yoga in this country is very, very commercialized. And it's been depicted as something that's only available for a few and only available for you if you you know, look a certain way, live a certain place, have a certain lifestyle. And if you think about it, it's really a shame because, because it's been depicted and marketed like that, the vast majority of people who would benefit from yoga or d would even know about yoga don't get to do yoga because they think that yoga is not for them. You know, I don't look like if I Google the word yoga or yogi, 
and see what comes up. I don't look like any of those people. I don't have the same socioeconomic level as those people. I don't live where those people live. I don't have that lifestyle that those people live. And so people just automatically cross out yoga as a form of exercise or a form of um, spiritual awareness or awakening because they think that it's not for them. So my greater purpose is to show that yoga really is for everybody. And the entire um, backbone, the entire meat of Elixir Yoga Lounge has been about that. Yeah, that, that's that's beautifully said. And I, I think that's the direction that I hopefully see yoga going. And I think we do see yoga going in a way that it's so universal. It's yes. so universal for so many people, no matter uh, what you're going through in life or what you want to achieve in life. So right. you created Elixir Yoga Lounge. So we could talk more about uh, Elixir Yoga Lounge. What do you, or why did you create elixir yoga lounge was it to fill a need that wasn't being met like you just mentioned providing yoga for all yes so providing yoga for all providing a you know i wanted to create a, a true authentic power yoga studio and in the area that i live in in northwest arkansas there's no studio that's truly committed to practicing, teaching, and developing within power yoga. It's it's normally like an amalgam of, of classes that teachers or that studios will teach. Um, and I think that's because they're trying to, you know, get as many clients as they can through their studio. It's, I mean, it's a business. You have to make money. And, and a lot of teachers think, or a lot of studio owners think that, you know, I can do that by offering as many things as possible. But I had a different perspective. I wanted to have a pinpoint purpose of the studio with regards to the asana and the kind of yoga that we practice here and just find that niche and really, really hone and sharpen and work within that and perfect that niche. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've done here. So not only to create a space that was truly welcoming and diverse for everybody, to create a space that had just an amazing community and not just on the surface, a community where we, um, we all thrive together. We support each other. We know each other's names, you know, like cheers. <laughs> we talk to each other. And I didn't, I didn't really see those things in the community, in the um, studios in my community. So, you know, there were several different directions that I could have went with um, feeling that needs that I saw in the community, but I decided to put every, all the, things that I saw that needed to be done in, in the one. <laughs> mm. And that was, that became EYL. Yeah. And diversity is a large part of, of that community as well. I, I know you mentioned, uh, can you explain more about that? So we have a very diverse community <laughs> here and, you know, I'm, I'm really proud to say that the, in the state of Arkansas, we're the first, you know, black owned yoga studio within the state of Arkansas, first of all, and being that, you know, you have a yoga, a studio owner who's a person of color that, you know, helps a, or an era of environment of diversity flourish in itself. And so not only that, because it's so much more than that, right? It's diversity is so much more than that. We just tend to talk about racial diversity, but I, one thing that we have also been really um, proud to have here is the largest population of LGBT yoga practitioners in this area. So we have a huge um, gay and lesbian, maybe bi population here at the studio. And I'm extremely proud of that because that's not something that I can say they're coming here because I'm gay, right? I can say that maybe if, if you know, you had a, a lady who resonated with me, who looked like me, who she came here, that she just came here because I look like her. But because I don't have that to say, to add to my, resume, right? <laughs> that I'm a straight woman, but I still have a huge gay population that feels welcome and it feels comfortable here. That's huge to me. Mm -hmm. And not, not only that, just body diversity, when you, and age diversity, we have people who come, who practice regularly here that are in their sixties, all the way to teenagers. We have people of all shapes, all sizes, all ability levels that all feel welcome to practice here and who all want to practice here because mm -hmm. of the environment of diversity that we've created. Yeah. And I think community is so important. And also in yoga, where you find not like other workout studios that you might be going at, people don't speak as much. It's not, right. it's, it's mm -hmm. a quiet class and you don't want to yeah. disturb anyone. You don't want to feel like you're disturbing anyone, but the community is so important and vital. 
How would you say, or what tools did you use for EYL that helped build that community and made it different than the other yoga studios that were around you guys? So there's two rooms in EYL and they're separated by a wall and a door. And so the, the room that you enter in is actually the yoga space. And you walk through the yoga space into what we call the lounge. And so basically it's a conversation lounge. <laughs> oh, wow. um, and, it, and it was set up that way. Like it was, the furniture was arranged so that people could converse before class um, and get to know each other. Um, the studio is pretty hot where we float. So most of the time people don't want to sit in the heat. For class. <laughs> they want to chill in the lounge because they know it's going to get cooking and things are going to get hard. So they like to take the time before class to chill in the lounge. And because of that, you have, you know, we max out at 15, you have, you know, 15 different people from all walks of life who are just sitting in the lounge and getting to know each other and sharing the stories of their day, sharing, you know, what's going on in their lives, getting to know each other's names and really starting to create that community and care about each other. So I think, in, and that was very intentional. It was very intentional to not just have, um, one one room per se where we have you know shelves in the corner where you come in we check you in you throw your mat down and it's and it's you wait for class I wanted to have that separate space to where people intentionally came together in a small space where they were kind of forced to interact with each other really <laughs> right and, yeah, it, and it's no, worked it, it's worked beautifully yeah no I think that's that's great and as a fellow athlete when I left my athletic career, I miss that team aspect. I, I, I sought yeah. it out and I tried different yoga studios. I tried CrossFit. I tried so many different things to get that team atmosphere and just to know somebody's name and cheer them on mm -hmm. and encourage them is, is so great and so powerful. Mm -hmm. So my next question is with this quarantine time right now, we're filming this during the, the COVID-19 quarantine time. How do you see the yoga industry changing? And how do you feel that we could continue that community, a sense of community? Changing with regards to just in uh, general? Just the, the industry changing. I know online yoga has become more popular than ever, and it's just something that we have to adapt. And we have to, a lot of studios are implementing, um, they might have been putting off for a while. And now mm -hmm. I think it's for the best in the sense mm -hmm. that being in the studio, having a physical studio is so important for that face-to-face -face and that building mm -hmm. that community. But at the same time, right. we're, we're busy, we have uh, responsibilities, and we don't always have the time to make it to the studio. But to get the most benefits from our practice is having that consistency and mm -hmm. having online programs, having online classes really allows for that consistency and to fit in those classes, maybe when right. you only have 20 minutes or when you cooking dinner and you just do a class for, for, for a half an hour. So yeah. how do you feel that the industry is changing and do you feel like it's, and how do you feel that we're, we're going to continue to build that community? I think, so I think that, you know, the community and yoga in general will change with regards to the online aspect, but I, I kind of suspect it will stay the same as well. There are certain extra or certain you know types of exercise that you can do that transfer really well online, like cycling, for instance, like Peloton, right? But yoga is one that you know if you have the opportunity to practice online at your own leisure, it's awesome because it's on your time, it's on your schedule. But I think that people really still want to be connected to a yoga instructor in person. Because, you know, I can, I can tell you to do a warrior two and even like show you in my own body how to, how to, you know, get into your warrior two. But it's, it's different if I can actually guide you with my adjustments into your idealized version of warrior two. And I think that, you know, people, most people who come to yoga are looking, they're looking to progress. So they're not looking to stay the same. And it's hard to progress with online classes without the personal guidance of a live instructor even within a class setting mm -hmm. but al but also i know that people love online workouts because it's 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 so flexible you know the, in when i have clients that when they travel 
for work, they're like, oh man, I wish I had some, this is before COVID actually, before we had online classes, I wish I could take, you know, your power yoga at my, in my hotel room before I go to bed. Um, do you ever have any ideas or plans of going online? And, you know, before COVID, I'm like, yeah, you know, that's, that's in the works. It's in the, it's in the plans for, you know, maybe the next year or two, but not right now where we're forced to go online now. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that, you know, there'll be studios and, and, um, and gyms that, that have yoga that will really nourish the online aspect and keep that going once studios are able to reopen. And there are those who will, you know, shy away from it because it's either, you know, too difficult to keep up both of them or they would just rather their, their protect practitioners come into the studio. So I can see, I can see both happening. I can see both the online presence um, increasing and I can see it staying the same. Mm-hmm. And I really like your perspective of as looking at it, at it more like a, a supplement to your practice in person and, and being a teacher myself, I know that cues are extremely important and the cues that I use are based on what I see the class yes. doing or a specific yes. person doing, uh, right. especially when you're just starting off or you're learning something new. It's extremely vital to have those cues and online is a great supplement. It's like you have a great diet, but you take the supplements to fill in maybe the, the points that you may be missing. So it's like kind of like the same thing. Right. And I, the next part is I saw that you were partners. Uh, so Elixir Yoga Lounge was partners with Orange Theory. Do you think mm-hmm. yoga complements other forms of exercise or do you feel that yoga is enough being both a physical and a mental practice? If you ask that to a yoga teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, I think, no, it's a, it's a great question. I think it depends on what you're looking for out of your physical practice. If you're looking, if you're a person who likes Orange Theory, <laughs> you know, it's, and, and even being partnered with Orange Theory, it's sometimes it's hard to convince, you know, die hard Orange Theory people that you can come to yoga and burn as many calories as you burn in Orange Theory, <laughs> right? And then, or in, in our studio, you can. And then, you know, once you get the Orange Theory people over here, they're, they're shook. <laughs> and they take a class and they're just they're like, oh my God, I didn't know there was going to be that. I thought it was just going to be stretching. And I'm like, well, yeah, there are, there's types of yoga that there, it's just stretching, but that's, that's not what we focus on here. <laughs> and you can definitely find those kinds of studios, but here you're going you're gonna to burn some serious calories <laughs> with the heat and with the flow and all the things that we do in class. So I, I, I hate to be that you know, girl again, but I think both is the answer. <laughs> Yeah, there's really no right answer to it. Yeah, it's it's kind um, of a trick question in that sense of whatever you prefer. Right, but I I definitely think that, and and have expressed this all the time, especially to clients that I have, they're diehard cyclists or diehard runners or you know orange diehard Orange Theory people. No matter, it's it's my belief that no matter what your sport of choice is, what your focus, where your athletic focus lies, yoga can only make you better. Period. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it's basketball, whether it's baseball, whether it's golf, I work with a lot um, of athletes at the University of Arkansas here, and I, I see all different kinds of athletes, and yoga can only make them better. Mm-hmm. I, I 100% agree with that. And then as someone who knows that yoga can be enough, even as a physical practice, mm-hmm. I sometimes just branch out and to go back to my, my running because running for me is very meditative or sometimes I just like to lift weights just for the sake of lifting weights. And though it's enough, sometimes when I come back to yoga, I appreciate it more. So yeah, yes, for sure. And you must be a strong believer in continued education. Uh, I know you have a strong academic background. What was your experience getting your 500 hour certificate and I guess, what advice could you give those looking to teach yoga and looking to get their advanced certificate? I know um, EYL has their own 200-hour teacher program. So my advice, and, and this is my advice with, with every teacher you know, training program, whether it's 200 or advanced 500, to just really get to know the person leading your training and or their abilities. And see if it's a match for what you're trying to accomplish with a yoga teacher training. I have um, so many friends that I've heard, you know, stories of them just kind of blindly signing up for yoga teacher trainings. Kids that they wanted to be a yoga teacher so bad, not really 
knowing the person that was leading it or the kind of style of leader that person or teacher that person is. And either they hated it or they dropped out. And that's just so heartbreaking to me. First of all, financially, that's heartbreaking, right? To pay three, four thousand yeah, dollars for something <laughs> and then hate it or drop out or did not get what you need, you know, just spiritually from it. Right. Because it's a, it's a, it's a journey to become a yoga teacher. And it's a, a huge part of it is spiritual transformation. What's happening inside emotionally. And if you kind of just sign up for these trainings kind of blindly, you just never know what you're going to get. It's kind of like a, a surprise, a grab bag, right? You could pull out something amazing or you could pull out something not so amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so, even, so even if you wanted to, and especially, you know, with the, kind of the controversy behind Yoga Alliance and, and their standards and how are they implementing these standards, you, you just really know what you're going to, you never know what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. And so even if, if you don't have the luxury to have a teacher training around you that, you, you know, you have practiced with the, the leader of the training or, you know, gotten to know them in this digital age, it's kind of, it's pretty easy to get online and find out a lot about somebody and even maybe take some classes with somebody online. So if there was somebody in New York who was interested in taking my yoga teacher training, then there would be plenty of material online for them to be able to research me, get to know me, my teaching styles, and all of those things so that they could not walk into something blind. Mm. And I know when I was doing uh, research for my teacher training program, I was really torn between that intensive program where it's like 16 mm -hmm. to maybe 30 days and that yeah. weekend-based program. I ultimately mm -hmm. chose the weekend-based program because I figured I, you really need time to ingest that material. And a lot mm -hmm. of the learning is done on your own by yourself right. through practice and through mm -hmm. reading and studying. Which one would you recommend if somebody was interested? Weekend-based. Weekend-based for sure. And because, like you said, you need that time to ingest everything. You know, I can, I can throw a, a manual at you and make, tell you to ingest it and digest it and, you know, learn it and memorize it within 30 days, <laughs> or I could give you more time so it can really land and stick with you. Right. And not only that, just the, my teacher training, a huge focus for the, for the students in my training is, is the development of, uh, development of your personal practice. And I can develop you over 12 weeks or I can develop you over 30 days. If you give me 12 weeks, we can go a lot further in that physical development. Like I can, one thing that we do in my training is for the first eight weeks, we practice the primary series of Ashtanga every single weekend. And it's kind of like, I tell, I tell my kids, that's what I call my kids, <laughs> that it's, it, if you think about it, it's kind of like going to the Marine Corps, right? Going to boot camp. <laughs> what do they do? They like break you down to rebuild you into a Marine, right? That is stronger primary series over eight weeks. is going to break you down and redevelop you into what it means to be a yogi physically and emotionally, right? I don't know if you've ever practiced Ashtanga, but it's, it's intense in that aspect. And that's what it's meant to do. It's mm -hmm. meant to kind of rebuild you, remold you into what, you know, the ancient ancestors of yoga believe that you should be as a yogi, particularly within, right? Taking the practice within, learning to withdraw senses and take everything within in order to become more enlightened or closer to God, right? Now, whether you believe in God or, or you want to even involve that in your yoga practice, Ishtanga is going to take, teach you to take your senses from externally to internally, right? And it's also going to transform you and develop you physically. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's beautifully put. It's something that I've been transitioning towards. I really kind of started off with vinyasa and that's kind of where my training and, and practice has been, but I've been drawn to that Ashtanga practice. It's just its physicality has really been what's drawn me but just as a whole, and it's really interesting to kind of see how they, the different styles integrate. So mm -hmm. for teachers and also students, you seem like you really fuse the ancient practice of yoga, like we were just speaking about, with a modern twist mm -hmm. for, to really reach a greater audience. Mm -hmm. How can students and teachers really I guess, spice up their, their yoga practice, especially for a lot of them practicing at home right now? 
Right. I think, well, especially at EYL, music plays a huge, huge role <laughs> in the environment that we um, create and, you know, just spicing things up. We, we like to use music as a motivator, as something that's going to encourage you to flow hard, right? When you're supposed to flow hard when, and to rest when you're supposed to rest and to slow things down and, and find uh, length and, and breath and beauty within poses when you're supposed to do that. So I think that um, definitely music can definitely spice things up. And it's so individualized. It's so personal, right? Music is. It's, it's, to me, it's highly personal. So any playlist that I can share with you is, is probably um, remnant, has remnants of what I was feeling when I made it within my personal life. What was going on in my life? What I was feeling that day? Was I moody? Was I happy? You know, <laughs> was I stressed? Or was I just like feeling myself, right? So um, music, for sure. Practicing with a buddy is always great. If you can do that social distancing, <laughs> practicing with a buddy is a great way to, sp to spice things up and to keep you, you know, kind of accountable. I think it's easy when you're watching a video by yourself online to kind of just chill, go get a drink, <laughs> right? Yeah, and pause it. Hang out take and a pause break. it. Yeah, maybe go live your best life for 30 minutes and come back. But <laughs> um, I think practicing with a buddy, if you could do it, maybe through Zoom or just, you know, taking the same class is also a great way to spice things up. Yeah, especially as it's getting warmer. I love just going to the park and, and practicing yeah. in the sun. You, you end up practicing for hours just because it's so relaxing, just being outside in nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You bring a speaker and then you get the music right there. Yeah. <laughs> And what what are some of your non-negotiables? Like, is it sleep? Is it your diet? Asana practice? What are some of your non-negotiables to make you, you, and, and really be a high achiever? For sure, sleep. <laughs> sleep. I, I've always, even when I was in high school, I was that girl who was in bed by 9.30. <laughs> even when I didn't have to be. I've always been that girl that's need, that needs at least eight hours of sleep. Definitely a non-negotiable there. And my friends, my best friends are non-negotiable for me. Like that's what kind of keeps me grounded in reality and keeps me not too serious all the time about, you know, yoga and about business and just about everything. It's just a non-negotiable for me to be able to, you know, go to happy hour with friends a couple of times a week or go to dinner and just really laugh and just talk about life and just explore those friendships and nurse those friendships. Also a non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Community seems like a really important thing for, for you. And it's really driven you to uh, such a, such a high level in entrepreneurship yeah. and just in, in teaching and overall as a person. So that's, that's great. And then is there anything else that you wish I asked or wish I didn't ask? Oh, no. <laughs> um, that, no. You think would bring value to the audience, any resources that you use for stress management I know you have a lot of things going on. Is there any tools or resources that have you have used that maybe the audience can benefit to really deal with stress? Yes. So one of my fellow Lululemon ambassadors that I met in Vancouver a couple of years ago, her name is Megan Moynihan. And don't ask me how to spell that because I don't know. <laughs> but she she wrote this. She studied with Deepak Chopra at the Chopra Center and became like this meditation guru in, in her 20s. And, and she recently wrote this book, um, not recently, last year called uh, Meditate, Don't Hate. And it's such an amazing tool because I love things that take ancient traditions and put a modern spin on them so that people want to be involved with them. People want to engage and like learn, right? And she wrote this book on meditation, this modern day book on meditation that, you know, even my kid would want to read because it's such an easy, elegant read, but it's so impactful with the content that that's within it. And she, um, that book is, 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 is a really good resource for that. Um, not only that, another book that I really, really like and that, um, that I, we read in teacher training is um, Way of the Peaceful Warrior by Dan Millman. It's a really, really good introduction, a little cheesy at times, <laughs> but I like it because it's cheesy, because it's easy to digest. Um, a nice introduction into mindfulness. 
and how that can change in your life and what true mindfulness is, is also a really good um, resource that I love to use. Yeah, the, the, no, that's great. I think the act of consistent consistency in anything is the art of simplicity. So anybody that could simplify it and make it engaging, it's, it's, it's challenge and it's such great because it's, it resonates with so many people on so many different levels. So. Right. Right. That's one thing that I tell my, um, the, the people in my yoga teacher training, you know, you're going to make, you're going to learn all these amazing things that you could say about every single pose and all these super anatomical ways to explain these poses. But if you can't break things down, make things simple, clear, and concise, (laughs) are you teaching? (laughs) Right. If nobody understands you because you're, you're being too, complex with your you know descriptions of things then you, you're going to have a hard time connecting with your with your students and so if you make things simple layman's terms everyday language that people can understand understand you're going to be a much more effective teacher and people are going to they're going to like you better as a teacher because they're going to think that you're actually able to teach them and that they can learn from you because at yeah. the end of the day that's that's what people who come to your class they want to learn from you they don't want to hear your fancy yoga vocabulary. <laughs> yeah. That's for us and only us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, you can get more information and follow Nicole Calhoun through her Instagram at Yoga Elixir. That's Yoga E L I X I R, Yoga Elixir, which she always is releasing new tips, strategies on improving your practice. So, you can also follow Nicole Calhoun on YouTube. She has her own YouTube channel, which she releases uh, additional tips and strategies to improve your practice. And finally, if you want to check out Elixir Yoga Lounge, simply check out the website, which is Elixir Yoga Lounge, uh, Elixir spelled E-L-X-R-Y, or just type it into Google. But I'll include all this and more in the show notes below. Thank you so much for joining this episode. I hope you love this conversation. If you're the type of person who has taken action to make life beautiful through the tools of yoga, I'd really appreciate if you headed over to iTunes and left us a raving review to keep this show going. Every review is read by myself, the host, and your feedback will most definitely be taken into account for future episodes. Also, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Have an extraordinary rest of your day, and remember... Our actions and thoughts are contagious, so make them good ones.